Ale tak by mohlo jet. A většinou to mi doma vůbec nejde. Jsem už ty nikdy vás čítal, když jsme jeli mít. Ja sem jaz tudi namehnala. To moje. To je tudi vrati smešna obština. Ne znam, ali čim več, ki tu sem še eno malo dobovali. In se ti se dogledaš nekakšne sveto. Ti se ti še vedno malo dok, ne? Ampak ni pred tudi.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Raya Hawthorne, and I'm assistant curator of Bio 27 Super Vernaculars. I'd like to welcome you to Wat Mao this morning for a symposium, The Bio 27 Journey, How Can We Make Cultural Production More Sustainable? It's a question that has preoccupied us from the outset, and so we decided to embed a sustainable approach in bio's activities. But what did that mean for us? This symposium explores what we have learned during this journey, looking at both the wider landscape of cultural production in which bio sits, as well as examining our own activities. Um, so to begin, I'd like to hand over to Nate Albo, Assistant Director of Mao, to open the session. Thank you, Raya. Uh, dear, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear distinguished guests, dear representatives of British Council, warmly welcome in Mao. Today, we will be talking about very interesting and important topic, sustainability in cultural production. But before, let me steal a moment. Yesterday, we opened a Biennial of Design 27. Biennial of Design is the biggest, organization-wise, the biggest project we are managing in Mao. It actually involves all the employees and all our outside partners. Um, I would like to thank all of them and congratulate them for a great job. Yesterday we had a great event. We have a wonderful exhibition. So I would kindly ask you for an applause for all of them. <laughs> Regarding the sustainability in cultural production, I would like to start with very interesting words I heard yesterday from Jane Witters on the press conference. She said, time of great ideas is over. Now it's time for radical action. And as being a cultural manager, this was quite significant to me because I believe we all want to have radical and effective action but sometimes we have some challenges. And for me, one of the basic challenges is that sometimes we have a difficulty to determine the gas emissions or the environmental impact of objects and services we use. For example, if we are very well aware of the economic value of almost every item we use, it's much different with uh, CO2 emissions for these items and for overall economic impact. And in order to be better in this way, of course, we need some pedagogical and andragogical tools. I'm really happy that one of the production groups within the Biennale was Team Futuring, who prepared and achieved two big great results. First of all, first one, we can see on the western wall of the room next to us. It is a very interesting comparison of CO2 emissions in Biennial 27 and CO2 emissions in Biennial 26. And I can say that the results are radical, radically different, radically better. And this is a showcase how a good design, a good conceptualization of the project can influence the overall uh, emissions and overall all, uh, environmental impact of a project. And the other, maybe even more important thing is here. The team prepared a very interesting booklet with the title Sustainable Cultural Production. These are the guidelines for cult cultural workers, cultural managers to be better in organizing their production. And I'm especially happy for the last page of this booklet, which gives us tools calculations and resources we can, which we can use while planning new 
pro projects. So I would like to thank you, the group Future Inc, for these two great achievements within this uh, limited time frame. In Mao, uh, sustainability is one of our core values. And we would like to be proactive and better in this field. That's why we decided that with the opening of Biennial, we will also sign a United Nations pledge toward more sustainable cultural production. This pledge will be signed in the end of today's event by our director, Dr. Bogozopancic. But this is not all. Uh, we believe that we need to lead. So we will invite all national museums and all, also all members of ICOM Slovenia to join us signing this pledge until the end of the biennial, until the end of September. And we hope and we plan that we'll be able to convince most of them, if not all of them, to join us in this sustainable movement. I would like to thank again the British Council for the support of Biennial and for the support of this event. And I wish you great panels, great discussion, and uh, especially sustainable cultural production. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Um, and now I'd like to invite Dragan Bobitovsky from the British Council of Slovenia, who so kindly supported the event. Dragan. Yes, thank you. Um, we started to think about, I think we met in June last year, Jane and Raya and, and Anya, when we, we were starting to think about how can we become part of Bio27. Showcasing is great, but if we can make this step further, it's even better. And I think what we have here is a result of that. And I'm very, very proud that not only are we gonna talk about it, what is sustainable cultural production, but we can also see it in action. There are several actions that we can see. Uh, Jen, you already quoted, I'm gonna quote you also from yesterday's press conference, <laughs> which is always the bad thing if a person is in, 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 in the room. <laughs> but you talked basically about this, about from thinking to action, and that for me, on, on behalf of the British Council is what's really the most important, that we are talking about action, that we can make change, and that we can also learn from each other, so neutrality is important, but also that this is gonna continue. So this is the start of the journey. The actions are that we have this toolbox. This toolbox is open, it talks about museums now, it, but it will grow, I'm sure. It's also open, so we're hopefully gonna see other areas of cultural production that are gonna be included that we're gonna learn from each other from the experiences in each of the areas. And so this toolbox is gonna grow with more and more sustainable practices that are being tested. So it's not theoretical again, it's in, you're being used in action. And so it's gonna be a motivation for others to do it. The other action point uh, is the exhibition itself. I think here we can see how we can make these steps towards sustainable cultural production in an in exhibition like Bio27. And I think the uh, creativity that, came, that went into this, I would never imagine the wood actually being a display itself and everything that is used, I think it's just a testament that, you know, again, of the action of something that can be done and we just not, not, don't talk about it, but we are doing something about it. And the third thing, another action point, is the pledge which will be signed today. It's the start of, of something new, something really a path that we are all gonna go through. So we are very happy to be supporting this. As I said, I really hope this is going to grow. We're going to go into other areas as well. I have also been told that other organizations are also thinking about it. Uh, Ljubljana Pride is going to take place on the 11th of June, and they also will be measuring their impact. They also will be looking at how they can minimize the environmental impact. So it is going around to other areas as well. And hopefully, you know, in, a, I don't know, in years' time, there will be two or three, four maybe of them. Uh, and that's what we're looking forward. So this is the start of the journey, start for the action points for the future. So thanks again for this, uh, for this event. All the speakers, great speakers, and I'm really looking forward to hearing much more from that. I tried to read this last night, but because it was also the opening, 
of bio. I didn't manage to, but that's why I'm here today to listen to everything that you're gonna present today. So thanks again, everybody, for taking part here in person or online, and I'm looking forward to the discussions today. Thank you, Dragon. Now everyone has already closed it out, but <laughs> I would like to invite uh, Jane Withers, curator of bio, to, to give her opening remarks. Thank you. Um, thank you, Raya. Um, good morning, everyone. It's great to see um, everyone here from last night and still <laughs> looking bright and sparkly <laughs> after it's quite a challenge in the timing. Um, I would just like to say that this symposium actually means a huge amount to me personally, and I think Raya and the studio, because a year ago, um, actually, you know, I think a year ago, I hadn't even been to visit Ljubljana and to get to know the Biennale, and it was a sort of dream that we would try and turn this around and make it a live project where we looked at its impact as we went through it, as we were doing the things. And of course, that takes a huge amount of support, collaborators, openness, generosity to do things in that way and sort of messiness along the way because you're throwing everybody's normal procedures out of the window at times and destabilizing the process. Um, I think one of the things I really learned what we'll come to in the panel se session later was how important the briefing stage is because I've done a you know, we've done similar processes before, but we haven't embedded it in the way of thinking at the outset quite to the degree here. And I think that's been the strength of it, that and the collab our partners in it. And that's one thing I'd really urge people to take away. You have to make it clear from the outset and at least sort of set your North Stars. Um, so I think... Well, we'll come back to it, um, the process and the sort of granular side in um, the panel discussion later this morning with the designers here. Um, but I think, you know, most of all, I'd like to say thank you to our collaborators and conspirators on this. Uh, to Bogo Zupancic, the director of MAO, and Nate Albel um, for their support and openness from the beginning, because it's a lot to ask to trust us and I think the um, and to Anya Radovich too who was sort of cheerleading for this from the beginning and in fact from our first conversations in, in the letter she wrote to me in response to the idea of super vernaculars she said we're going to do this and embed it in Mao and bio um, so I think that's been extremely important but we couldn't have done that without the experts and the guidance. Um, first of all from my advisory panel Anna Struger Breger who was sort of you know guided us on how to navigate the local scene and who to work with and so on from the beginning and we had some very inspiring conversations. Um, to Graciela Melitsko Thornton from Julie's Bicycle who we'll hear from in a minute who I think spoke so eloquently to the designers and made it seem tangible and possible at the outset and said there are no silver bullets but you know this is the approach you could perhaps take um, and made it seem a lot less daunting um, to Sophie Thomas who's been our North Star as well and we're here from shortly um, and sort of we've collaborated before but has been huge about inspiration and practical advice and support throughout um, to the designers that we'll be speaking to later to Med Prostor, Kellenberger White Studio Crew and AA who took the briefs from the beginning and made them their own um, and to the futuring team who were going to see the toolkit and who've really made the legacy of it all so I'd just like to say thank you very much to you all and to the British Council too and to Dragon for supporting us. Thank you. Thank you Jane. So um, this morning we have three sessions exploring different aspects of uh, cultural production. And the first session, What is the State of Sustainable Cultural Production, chaired by Sophie Thomas, mentor to design the Bio27 production platform team Futuring, and designer, waste and sustainable design expert, will include a snapshot of international and local best practice um, and learnings from Bio27. So before I ask our speakers to come up to the stage, I'd, I'd like to invite Graciela Melitsko-Thornton from Julie's Bicycle 
to give a presentation and Graciela has been really instrumental in supporting the, the production platform and giving all of the design team her advice and knowledge um, throughout the process. So, Graciela. Thank you, Ria. Thank you very much. I'm really delighted to be here with you. Uh, this is the type of projects that we like to get involved. So it's been a pleasure really delivering the training, sharing ideas. And thank you, Jane, for saying, doing it less daunting, because uh, that's, that's where we feel that uh, sustain, sustainability needs to be exciting, ecological thinking, something approachable, something that we can work with. Uh, we need to avoid perfectionism. I mean, uh, sometimes in, uh, maybe designers are going to be horrified that I say this, but certain perfectionism uh, is, uh, goes against really the flexibility we need for sustainability. And I'm going to run through this presentation because it's a very, very busy morning and there is a, a lot of very interesting panelists, but I just want to leave with you some, some of the ideas and, wo and what we are doing. And to do that, I'm going to be sharing my screen. Um, we said that we need to go through the advanced sharing screen. Um, hmm. It's not working. It did work in our rehearsal. Can you see my screen now? Not right now. No. Okay. So it, it looks like it might have been coming there. I'm not sure. Keep try, try again. Yeah. Yes, yeah, now we've got it. And can you see the second one? Yeah. Yes, we can. So it's moving. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. It's not the best uh, way of sharing, but I'm going to leave it there so it works. Uh, for the ones that don't know us, Juvi, Ju, who we are, Julie's Bicycle is a charity. We mobilize the arts and culture to act on the climate and ecological crisis. And we support the arts and culture to become net zero and restore nature, inspire public action on climate and ecology, and champion environmental justice and fairness. Um, Julie's Bicycle this year is 15 years old and it was founded by the music industry, but we are now working across arts and culture. We partner with more than 2,000 organizations in the UK and internationally, and we combine cultural and environmental expertise, and we focus on high impact programs and policy change to meet the climate crisis head on. And I think this is important to share the way we work because uh, for this project, I think it's a good example of combining, combining everybody in the whole ecosystem, from artwork to activism, organizational leadership, design and innovation, collaboration all across the system. And definitely, how is this evolving and coming into policy changing? So mainstreaming all these actions. Uh, we now know that climate change is here, the ecological crisis is here, there is no doubt about that. So the decisions we make now will set the course for the next millennium on this planet. So no pressure there. So <laughs> we really need to see what we are doing. What is really positive is that there is quite a lot of partners coming into the field, coming into the network, Every day we see more and more specialized toolkits and uh, for more specialized activities. Yesterday, the Gallery Climate Coalition came with a campaign about transporting art, for instance, working with all the art transporters. Um, there's, there's a lot of initiatives, coaching, supporting, so I think we all need to make the best use of that. 
a little bit about the way we work on, on the day-to-day -day practice is not only understanding environmental impacts, but also looking at strategy and policy. How is it, this impacting in our business model? Uh, one thing that we always say, uh, you, you are going to be, um, re by reusing uh, materials, you are going to be spending less on, on materials, but it's good to spend more on training, on capacity building. So, and then we are looking at people and communities, how culture makes place as well. How is it something so important in our day-to-day -day life? And during the lockdown, we took the opportunity to reflect and do more research. And we came with this piece of research that we call it the art of zero, which is a, a snapshot, a photography of what's happening in the visual arts and museum sector globally. Some, some of the, our conclusions is that um, were at that point that the visual arts as a whole is not prepared yet. It needs to do more, really. It needs to do more work to roadmap uh, science-based targets, action, put all this into practice. Um, there are pockets of excellence, but not enough. So we need really to, to become more synergetic with these pockets of, of excellence. Commitment is evident. We, lots of people are committed to this. We need to strengthen those, those relationships, those links. Artists need to be supported in their climate work. Leadership is needed. And this recovery opportunity is once in a lifetime opportunity where visual arts can make an exceptional contribution. And from inspiration from the sector, again, during the lockdown, we took time to think through with, with some individual projects like yours as well. So next time we will have a slide about your project. That is, it's a fantastic project, really. And, and um, we took the time to plan from the outset, as Jane as said, with this exhibition that is now also open at the Barbican in London, our time on Earth, that got a lot of interesting research in the background as, as well. Um, but we also took the time to think, okay, how do we need to engage all partners and collaborators in an exhibition? How to, do we need to brief designers from the contractual point of view at the very beginning, communicating why all this is really important? And we look at materials, longevity, provenance, the need to reduce what we use, understanding what is coming into and out of the organization, and choosing to products or look into alternative materials that are long lasting, that can be reused, repaired, recycled, or biodegraded. And when we are building, we want to design for disassemble or the construction and low, low toxicity. You got the pictures, and, and, and when you already have waste, think creatively about what to do about waste. You got there in that picture the crates from the BNA. Um, London Museum, where they did a fantastic project with local carpenters, upcycling all these crates and using all this furniture in community projects locally or for beekeeping, for instances. Another very interesting example that we were having in early conversations uh, was the Biennale of Sydney. Uh, they look into partnership for innovation. They, they were seeking innovators, creating or reinventing materials to be utilized in the exhibition. They went into the designers and the innovations with their problems, which were their problems in the previous biennales and why they wanted to do this more sustainable. And, and as we said, for designers always, and architects, so it's important to look into materials. Every material has trade-offs. So <clears throat> we are not, I, I'm, I'm a bit croaky today, sorry. <clears throat> we need to look at the, uh, uh, is, uh, the right material for the right use. Obvi obviously, we are always avoiding to use virgin materials. Uh, there's going to be now a lot of an expansion on the material side of things. So we want to be, um, when, when we read biodegradable or compostable, we want to fully understand is it this compostable for the system I have in place 
always looking at these concepts into into in the relationship with the with the system and what means eco what means green what is natural question a little bit uh, these these concepts from the outset and just the last few words because i'm aware of time that we are delighted that the toolkit really uh, is being out there and i think it's going to be a fantastic tool to work with museums and exhibitions. Count on us for, for a sort of um, talking about it, and we will be talking about, we have a lot of projects with museums and exhibitions, and we try all, always to share all the, all the learning from everybody and make it more synergetic so um, this can have a, a, a broader impact, a higher impact. And thank you very much to all the bio team. It's been delighted to really uh, work with you. And I wish I was there really <laughs> to see the exhibition that we know quite a lot about it now. But yeah, may maybe. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll, I'll read the, the, the publication. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Graciela. Um, and now I'd like to invite uh, Sophie Thomas to join us, uh, along with Jana Babshek from ICOM Slovenia, Alenka chernilic uh Chair of ICOM Southeast Europe, um, uh, to, to join us for the, the panel discussion. I'm terribly sorry, I've forgotten somebody exceptionally crucial <laughs> is Anna Radovic, head of bio, who's um, just been such a wonderful colleague and uh, really got us to the end of this journey. Thank you. Thank you, Raya. Uh, is this on? Oh, so uh, thank you, everybody. And it's uh, fantastic to be here. Um, if not, I feel slightly guilty because I had to, uh, you know, just being somewhere, having to come somewhere and fly somewhere is just like very difficult when you're a sustainability consultant. But we can have a big debate about that later. I'm quite happy to do that. Um, but uh, we've got a fantastic uh, panel here. Uh, we get, it's not a very long panel, but what I'd really like to do is to talk um, about not necessarily what the toolkit does, but the kind of landscape that this toolkit is going to be start hopefully to be used in and how the kind of cultural and uh, uh, sector need there is and where we are at, particularly in Europe, specifically in Slovenia, and then the, the lessons we've learned at Bio27. So, um, Elenka, I'd love to start with you. Um, do you feel like there's uh, the timing now? If you could give us a bit of a kind of picture of what's going on um, in the areas, because you cover 11 countries, don't you, with I through ICOM? Uh, thank you. Uh, hello to everyone. I'm honored to be here. Uh, it's the same with us. Uh, with uh, less, uh, lot, not so much of connection. Maybe my English is a bit rust in one way. So if I will have to find some word, please, Slo Slovene people, help me. <laughs> uh, even though we connected through Zoom and everything all the time, but you know, when you are really in this real time, it's different. So, okay, uh, Southeast Europe is complex um, a regional alliance in one way. But uh, I have to say that this sustainable um, uh, approach to the museum work um, is already implemented in many projects. Um, when I was uh, listening to you through the media, reading in newspaper, and also just have a gl glimpse uh, in this toolkit, I was thinking uh, we are working on this for several years already. Maybe we were just not so... Um, how do you say, not brave enough, it's not the brave, it's not the word, uh, uh, it's not the right word, but to put in one place, as you did it now, um, as we have some projects, for example, one of the most successful in our region was uh, reorg, reorganization of our depots. We know that museums, really one of the most important job is uh, to take care of the objects, even though now we are all very much switched to the person, to the story around the objects. But on the same time, this keeping is very important. It also has a lot to do with sustainability, with the materials that we use, with the way we store it. So that was one of the most important and also successful 
uh, projects um, um, started a few years ago, also with the ICROM as the, the, com the uh, institution that you have as uh, the partner of um, uh, this Julie's bike bicycle had it uh, on the slide. So uh, we tried to do that in many, many fields. And this was maybe one of the first one, as we know that uh, problems with the depot, we keeping with, uh, with um, how do you say, not just keeping with the understanding and knowing what we keep, why we do keep it, uh, why we need to keep it. You know, this is a huge conversation in museum world now. And with the sustainability, of course, also, um, it goes quite well. I, uh, I have to be quick, so this is, no, is this okay? This, yes, <laughs> that's perfect. So uh, I think it, uh, what uh, it was said, it is here with the usage of material, with usage the right material to restore, to conserve, to reorganize everything that um, if it's organized, you know, this is very important. You know, where do you have it? Uh, how do you keep it? Where do you find it? So this is also one thing, and this, this was quite successful in many countries, also in Slovenia, and we have uh, with ICOM Slovenia every year, we have a special project uh, regarding that. So on the other hand, uh, with all the things that are uh, doing basic, as you noticed, from uh, how to manage the visitors, how to, um, how to include all the um, s uh, staff, to be as much sustainable as it possible. Just my colleague said, you have printed everything on both sides. <laughs> so you don't have space where to put the notes. This is just one basic thing, but you know, as we see, it's very important. So we're trying to do that. Maybe we are not so um, good in promoting it and maybe putting in one, uh, in one project or maybe in one, in one material, something like that. So I'm thankful to you for doing that. Fantastic answer. I think there's two things I would pull out of that, as you say. It, the, one of the most important things that we have found through the work that I do is making sure the data is kept and the data is kept up to date and like understanding where things are and understanding the needs for different materials and different artifacts. So sort of that climatic uh, requirements and that collective understanding so that you can work together. So, you know, when we were working, for instance, talking to... Um, one of the big, the Horniman Museum in, in London and talking about the kind of how they could pull together all their collective storage facilities of their objects, of their archival objects, is something that is, we're very short of space in London, so it's, a, it's a really quite a key question, but it's, it's quite, um, it's not very sexy, it's quite technical, but that's the, that's the, is the nature of a lot of this, a lot of these pieces. Um, so Jana, do you want to give a bit of a Slovenian perspective from Icon? Um, yes, in Slovenia, I, we do have these guidelines made by the Ministry of Culture that we should have sustainable museums, but we do not have specific goals. So it's up to every manager of the museum how he would in, uh, implement those things and of his awareness and his values and th the, the values of uh, their team. But as far as I know, a lot of museums, they really uh, uh, take care of this sustainability in many ways. Um, and uh, in this general way, you know, uh, regarding waste, um, this is long, uh, for many years, uh, the fact, but also uh, we encourage, for example, the, those simple things as catering. We all always encourage the local production um, to, to, uh, to, to have a shorter this, uh, uh, this chain of, of pr products that it's uh, as, as short as possible. Um, we encourage to use this tap water uh, because in Slovenia almost everywhere water is uh, very good. So we, we, we encourage that um, even with special um, uh, bottles uh, made by Slovenian museums to, to encourage to drink tap water. Um, and then, um, of course, uh, with uh, these temporary exhibitions, we uh, always try to reuse all the materials to um, use the e equipment as long as possible, um, you know, and to, um, you know, to, to make uh, uh, these reparations of old objects and include them into the exhibition um, 
um, equipment and so on. Uh, with, but I think with the designers of the um, exhibitions, we do not systematically work on, on uh, using sustainable materials, not yet. It's just really up to each museum, to each manager. Um, and other things, I don't know. We have those pedagogical and pedagogical programs and we ha have these uh, workshops many times um, and we use, uh, you know, uh, recycling, uh, recycled, uh, we, we, uh, we, we try to implement those values uh, that, uh, that things should be recycled, that old things should be repaired um, and reused and so on. So um, we do that all the time. And I don't know, um, there are many, many other fields. For example, a lot of museum buildings are being renovated and they are um, always, they, we always uh, work together with the Institute for Renovation and Conservation and they encourage us to use the old, um, uh, the old techniques of construction and to uh, old, old materials and they do not let us use, um, you know, some new, um, not renewable materials and so on. And we take care that, that these renovations are in energetically really um, mm, sustainable. So, so very super it's vernacular. A, it's a, a little bit of everything, <laughs> but you know, it's not organized. And I'm very happy that this should, could be, you know, this, the encouragement to, to, to be more organized, even the museum uh, managers, you know, to have some strategy. Yes, I think working together and kind of that collaborative piece is, is so important because often you find out that everybody is doing their own thing, but actually it's, there's so much learning that can happen across and it's not a competitive thing, it's actually sort of that, all that learning. Um, so, uh, Anya, over to you. So you have clearly been such an important uh, person for pushing through all the sustainability for Bio27. Um, we were talking earlier about how actually it, 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 you took it on, but it's actually it built a whole layer of complexity and challenges for you. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, maybe from <coughs> now on with the toolkit, it's going to be a little bit easier <coughs> to start with new projects. Um, but definitely from practical and organizational uh, point of view, um, we were researching the topic, building the toolkit, uh, and doing it at the same time. So um, maybe this, now the step further would be really to start from the toolkit and then build the project um, around it. And also, uh, I would say, uh, for example, um, just getting people um, to think in the same way uh, was also some effort. Uh, for example, uh, borrowing the wood sounds really easy. <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah, it sound, sounds really easy, but you know, um, convincing the people um, that supplied the wood um, to borrow us uh, um, their almost whole amount of the wood that they were uh, drying for two years and then um, also want to give it back uh, in a way that was a, a really weird conversation we had <laughs> with them, you know, just um, trying to explain how and what uh, and why yeah, we're doing this. I think that's, yeah, it, it's so funny when you start to have, you, you go through, okay, we want to do this, the aspiration of the designers, and then you go, all right, who's going to pick up the phone and have a conversation with a wood with the firewood supplier? And often, you know, they go, they there's curious, they go, like, what, what? Uh, but actually, in the end, they're up for it, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. We found <coughs> we found a really nice uh, supplier that was uh, willing to collaborate uh, to provide all the wood, and um, of course, it didn't come with no cost. Uh, it still was um, a, a huge part of the debate as well. So, um, because I think it also, um, we also needed his uh, engagement in the whole thing. Um, but yeah, it's also little things. For example, <coughs> trying to uh, convince everyone that was shipping us um, their uh, 
um, exhibits to try to use the uh, sustainable wrapping materials, uh, sometimes not answering uh, some emails with just thank you, because we know that also um, is contributing to the impact. Um, and not printing all the loan agreements, for example, and just these kind of little things. Yeah. And it actually, it really does make a difference. So when we, w we did the environmental audit for the Design Museum show Waystage, and we, we, we built a tracker email, so we right from the beginning, we, we told them to CC the email in that tracked how many, and we, I mean, I don't think we caught everything, and we know we didn't, but there were about 11,000 emails going back and forth and I think about, um, I think it was about 10, ridiculous amount, 10 gigabytes worth of, of uh, data going back and forth. And that's, that was actually, we got them to all put it onto a Google Doc, so it was a, sh a sharing folder, <coughs> which really helps, because every time you take an email back and forth, it's just like clocking up CO2. And it was about a ton in the end, just from email use. Which, you know, in a case of when you've got an exhibition which is only about 21 tonnes, that's, that's quite sizeable. So these kind of forgotten things all the way through. Very, uh, really interesting. Um, we've got a minute. Uh, does that include... <laughs> of course, it's so super quick. Um, does that include questions? Has anyone got any questions for, these, for this wonderful panel? It, for me, it sounds, and it, this is always the case, you know, when you start um, talking to people who are working in these areas, you realize there's so much going on, but it's just not connected. And I think this, to me, is the, the best thing about the toolkit and from Bio27, that it's actually really kick-starting new conversations and new, um, uh, not so much collaborations, but that kind of, where should we put all that knowledge? Where should we gather it? How do we then build upon it? You know, what happens next? You're absolutely right, you've done the hardest bit this year, and now it just becomes like, how do you make better? How do you continue to push? And also, what challenges did you have this year that you can then put into a brief for next year or for the, year, you know, for the next time? So I think it's always about lessons learned, and, it, and with all this kind of thing, it's, the technology is changing, the materials are coming in, new materials, uh, you know, new, so, something that we thought was good two years ago then suddenly becomes not good next year so um, it, that's why it's really important to keep that data and sharing going and an open source um, anybody else with just one minute no yes of course um, well it's it's quite nice to to recognize now that actually the most sustainable building is the building that is already built so Slovene museums and most of the museums of Southeast Europe are actually in this type of old buildings. <laughs> so even though we don't want to be so much in sustainable regarding our museum work, <laughs> we actually are one of the most sustainable organization, uh, organizations um, in this field in one way. Uh, even though we, ha and we are adjustable really much because uh, we never had enough money not to recycle our uh, showcases and everything. And this is sometimes um, really hard when you, do, do, uh, when you have a designer that wants to do something new. Um, and it's nice that this is now the trend in one way. <laughs> uh, thank you. This was just a comment in one way because um, uh, sometimes the, the um, how do you say, opportunities are also in this, what we think that is actually a disadvantage. But because in museum work, uh, old bidding is mostly a disadvantage uh, for developing what we want, what we say. Uh, or, but in, now, in this case, we can always say, as we are working this building, this is, our, uh, this is our pledge to sustainability. This is, we know we have many restrictions, but we can do that with the help of visitors, with understanding of visitors, with understanding of our financiers, and also museologists that we can do as best as we can with all of this. Thank you. Very good. Good ending. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to, uh, to you all. And it's really encouraging to see that there is such an appetite to develop a um, sustainable approach to cultural production. Um, and so next, I would like to introduce our second session. 
the Bio 27 Futuring Toolkit, again chaired by Sif Thomas, and with the team Futuring, Barbara Pradhan, Jean Cobalt, Tamara Natic Djokovic, and one of the production platforms who will present their open source toolkit, which aims to empower cultural institutions and designers in reducing the impact of their work. Welcome. So thank you very much, uh, dear distinguished guests, uh, dear organizers, uh, good morning. Um, before we begin, we would like to thank uh, to the curator, Jane Witters, assistant curator, uh, Raya Hovtoran, the Biennial's main organizer, Anja Radovic, and of course our mentor, Sophie Thomas. Thank you for inviting us uh, to take the part in the Biennial and for entrusting us actually with this very, we believe, very important task. A task that will, hopefully, help us build a better future <coughs> together. Oops, sorry. Our primary research focus was sustainable, or better yet, regenerative cultural production for museums. And as we know, the nature of the global challenge of climate change requires a collective response across all sectors and scales. Museums can play a pivotal part in this because of their outstanding educational and social role. Before addressing our findings from the study, it is important to highlight that sustainability goes beyond environmental and carbon neutrality and fits into the larger picture, namely the triple bottom line of people, planet and prosperity. Or to put it differently, we strongly believe that museums should primarily focus on diversity and distribution and ways to inspire others to take collective action. The objective of this commission was using the possibility of the biennial to interrogate its practices and future. We wanted to gain a deeper understanding of the environmental and social impact of the bio 27 and how we can make a positive change. Based on the gather insights and proposed guidelines, it is now possible, and we are very much looking forward to this, it is now possible to design a roadmap enabling the biennial and the Museum of Architecture and Design teams to reduce emissions and set de decarbonization targets going forward, as well as demonstrating and communicating innovative approaches to sustainable cultural production. Nevertheless, it is important to stress that the intended audience for these guidelines is any individual or organization that creates, defines, publishes, produces, distributes, and uses cultural production within a museum or cultural environment. Recommendations are statements designed to help end users make informed decisions on how to reduce carbon emissions, organize administrative operations efficiency, build the community with outreach and education, and last but not least, how to ensure sustainable exhibition production. Based on our research and findings, we created a toolkit composed of information and knowledge gathered from different sources and practices which are already searching for sustainable exhibition design solutions and museum management. Rather than rigid instructions, we wanted the toolkit to function as a set of helpful, helpful guidelines empowering museums and designers in their first steps towards sustainable cultural production. We started the research for the commission, commission by looking into several examples of good practices that show how minimized, minimizing the impacts of cultural production can be done. One of the first examples is actually an exhibition that Sophie already mentioned, and it was curated by Jane. It's a waste to age exhibition at the Design Museum in oh, Kensington. Okay. Oh. okay. Um, the Design uh, Waste Age exhibition at the Design Museum in Kensington, London. By embedding sustainability at the very core of the exhibition, they managed to dramatically reduce its expected impact from 185 tons to 10 tons of CO2 emissions 
which signif with significant reductions coming from switching to renewable energy and rethinking the materiality of the exhibition. As an example, they used unfired and unfixed adobe bricks for part of the build, which compared to using only fired ones, cut emissions by roughly six tons of CO2 emissions. After the exhibition, these, the bricks were easily disassembled and returned for further use. By embedding this kind of circularity in their approach and by using biodegradable materials, designers uh, can in fact significantly reduce the carbon footprint and the afterlife impact of structures. Another example we looked at was the Sustainable Museum Art and Environment exhibition presented at the Museum of Contemporary Art in B Busan. When rethinking the operational organization of the exhibition, they focused on minimizing the, the emissions connected to transport of artworks by cutting out long distance transport altogether and instead live streaming the pieces located remotely or, re or reproducing the installations locally. In addition, they decided to use reclaimed materials for the build, leaving them unpainted, which allowed to further use after the exhibition was ended. Looking at practices like these, as well as alternative modes of sustainable production, we, de we developed a toolkit that consists of five main sections. First steps, museum, exhibition and exhibition design, graphic design print, and digital communication and design. Each section is composed of an intro cont contextualizing the importance of the guidelines, practical information and instructions on how to minimize the impacts, infographics visualizing specific impacts where, where relevant, and examples of successful practices. Functioning as autonomous entities, the sections focus on relevant information for different interest groups or experts, uh, and therefore some information is duplicated in different sections. In first steps, we present the actions to be taken on an institutional level of the museum to declare its intention towards carbon neutrality. In the museum section, we pinpoint the main areas of emissions for museums and provide instructions um, to identify the opportunities for improvements as well as practical guidelines on how to tackle those. For easier navigation, the toolkit of the toolkit, these guidelines are broken down into different interest points for the museum, such as operations and building efficiency, advertising, waste, and community outreach, to name a few. The exhibition and exhibition design section includes guidelines for planning and organizing an exhibition, exhibition design, tips on construction and deconstruction, electronics, with a large emphasis on materials and the importance of material selection. We provide examples of low impact construction materials and materials for signage and which materials should definitely be avoided. In graphic design print, we look at printed media, providing a, a guide on how to approach designing layouts and signage in a sustainable way, and further elaborate on printing processes, providing information on paper, inks, binding, coating, and uh, packaging for designers and museums to start conversations with contractors um, and make informed and responsible choices. Finally, in digital communication, and design, we provide guidelines for sustainable digital design as well as digital communication approaches. Uh, to present the toolkit in a more tangible way, I will now present how we used it ourselves to calculate some impacts of Bio 27 and Bio 26, compare both, as well as speculate on how Mao could improve some of its inf infrastructures and become more sustainable, even regenerative. For Bio 26, all the exhibition furniture was built out of aluminum, which resulted in more than nine tons of CO2 equivalent emissions. To understand the environmental impact better, we have translated this amount um, into the number of trees that would have to be planted and grown for 10 years in order to offset these emissions. As you can see, for Bio 26, 47 trees would have to be planted and grown for 10 years to offset them. Uh, but this year, the exhibition uh, is built out of firewood, as mentioned before, that was bo borrowed from local suppliers for the, dura the duration of the biennial. Um, borrowing the material instead of buying new has helped um, the team to radically reduce the impact of the exhibition setup. Um, 
the choice of material brought down the overall CO2 equi equivalent emissions by more than seven tons, which is 4.7 times less than that of Bio 26. Mm. Uh, about the travel, um, at Bio 26, the production platform pro program consisted of two designathons in which designers of 17 different countries participated in person here in Ljubljana. To be precise, in the first designathon, there were 38 local and 44 international designers involved, while in the second designathon, nine local and 21 international designers participated. This, of course, resulted in a lot of traveling and consequently a lot of CO2 emissions. We've ca calculated that for offsetting Bio 26 production team travel, um, approximately 114 trees would have to be planted. And to reduce the travel emissions, this year's production platforms were mo open mostly to local designers. In the end, uh, 30 local and three international designers participated. And to offset our footprint, this year only six trees would have to be planted. Um, and an additional tree to offset our on online meetings. Uh, we find it very fascinating uh, how one simple cur curatorial decision can lead to such different results in terms of footprint. Mm. Currently, uh, Mao is being powered by nucle nuclear energy, which isn't problematic in terms of CO2 emissions. However, on a regenerative scale that you can see here, um, uh, zero emissions only means that we're not doing any more harm. But we believe that in order to turn things for the better, we should try to act regeneratively. We have calculated that if Mao would install solar, solar pa panels on its south facing roof, it could produce more than 800,000 kilowatt hours of power. This would not only meet the energy demand of the museum, but would also be enough to power additional 52 aver average Slovenian households. Mm. For our next steps, uh, you can probably imagine that it is practically impossible uh, for our, our toolkit to ever be finished, since the technologies, materials and measures are constantly changing and progressing. That's why in the following months, we will make a digital version of the toolkit, which will be open source, allowing for updates and expansion even beyond the time frame of Bio 27. We strongly believe in vernacular, vernacular knowledge of diverse environments, and we want this guide to stand on the shoulders of many. That's why we will invite museum staff, professionals, and visitors to give feedback and contribute with their knowledge and insights. In September, we will also organize toolkit introduction workshops for Mao and other Slovenian museums and cultural institutions, where we will, we will show how to use our toolkit and how to start measuring, planning, and executing a sustainable transition. Thank you. Hello. Uh, fantastic. Uh, I'd just like to say it is an amazing guide. Congratulations for doing it. And I think it's going to be used so much. I mean, I'm taking a couple home with me. And I've already marked mine up to things to do. So I would suggest if you haven't read it, you know, read it when you're traveling, read it when you're about to go to sleep or when you wake up. Um, because there are so many things in it, which actually what really... Um, interest me is the fact that you can go in and it's, it's, it's so practical. You need to do this. It's very like, it's action focused. We've been talking about, you know, n enough talk. Let's get on with it. And this, this guide is very much, you know, of like, this is what you need to do. Don't mess around. Call, call the timber people, you know, get on with it. And, um, but then also there's some really big concepts in it as well. So you've really kind of mixed it up. How are you wanting people to use it? Because I think, you know, you talked a bit about it going digital. But what, what, was, what do you think would be a really su good success story for you?
Well, our success story, would, I think it, it's already starting today in a way because of the pledge that is going to be signed. But of course, um, then the hard work actually begins because <laughs> signing is the first step in order to actually acknowledge the, the, that we need to change our behavior. So this is actually something that we want to um, spark, let's say, this uh, debate also, because when we start, when we were talking about the designers, uh, but I'm not talking about the, the crew designers because they were really keen on uh, going on uh, while des designing this toolkit, uh, trying to go as far as possible in order to read our instructions and uh, come up with the solution, um, actually responding to it. But when I talk to other designers who are, let's say, designing exhibitions and so on, they were always saying, oh, but do we really need to start with our exhibition to doing this? So it's, it's something, it's a behavior change. And I think, um, it, of course, there, are, there will be a lot of obstacles, a lot of boundaries. But I really um, was, was very uh, interesting or very, um, and uh, very happy to hear that actually when you were starting, you many people were saying to you that, oh, but this is difficult, this is hard to start, and so on. But actually, I don't know, you said in one or two year time, then suddenly the printer is calling you and saying, okay, I have this and that, would you be interested? And so, and this is something I would find a success. So right now it is, when you start, I know that Anya will say, talk to start talking to the printer and demanding, I don't know, this kind of paper, this kind of, uh, kind of print and so on, and ink. Of course, it's difficult, it's difficult to change, but then, yeah, so this is something that I would, uh, in order, let's say, you said before it's not a competition, it's a collaboration, but in a way, can we make a competition who can <laughs> make a better uh, s a solution for us? Yeah. Push it forward. Yeah. And I think hopefully we can hear a bit about the designer's response to this going into the brief, because actually one of the main, uh, the really important things that is that, you know, when we were doing the work with Waystage, it was about bringing the data right to the front and right to the beginning of the process, so you had... What we see a lot and what I deal with is like the designer's dilemma. How do I know which material to choose? How do I know, uh, you know what the alternatives is? Is it better? Do I trust the specification or that the supplier is giving me? All those kind of the technical sides of design. You know, this isn't about taking the fun out of design. This isn't about the aesthetic. This is about making sure that the message is in there, it's integral into the materials and integral into, uh, so very much, you know, the medium is the message. You see that upstairs, you can see that. And actually having the firewood there also triggers another conversation about energy creation. And, and that kind of very, um, for me, it, was, it struck me, and I think it's very much sort of woven through the whole of the toolkit that this kind of super vernacular um, expression of locality has to come through in sustainability. You cannot get your you say you cannot say I want to use recycled paper, but I have to ship it in from Italy or or fly it from China. That is not possible. And that understanding of like your locality, your local suppliers, and your local um, the local knowledge and expertise is so fundamental. And I think that really came through. Did you find it? You, did you enjoy working on the project? Tell us a bit about that. I mean, it was a daunting task. I think um, start. It requires. It required us to rethink how we think about research and design, and I think that also will reflect uh, reflects in practice, really. So I think when you asked before what would be our success story, I think it's empowering people in their first steps towards sustainability and make that a bit easier and create like an almost an entry point towards sustainable cultural production. Um, but yeah, I mean, we learned a lot. Uh, it was a very <laughs> steep learning curve. Uh, <laughs> a lot of information, um, a lot of calculation. Um, but w what we realized quite early on is which I think is reflected also then in practice is transparency of information is very lacking, um, and there I there is just no information out there yet. That's why I think it's important for cultural institutions to kind of start mm, this joint journey and start pressuring um, contractors and suppliers to provide those informations and make them easily accessible. Um, and that that will propel sustainability in cultural production further. Yeah, 
this. There is a there is a, such a uh, there are big holes in data that when you start designing around, you're like, I need to find, you know, I was talking to you before about needing to find the the carbon uh, impact of a dye sublimation ink for textiles, and I could not find it anyway. And I was like, I'm quite lucky because I have a network of uh, data specialists and, you know, people who work in waste resor waste management, and I was like trying to find this information. I was thinking, God, if I was just starting this journey, I would even... I would get absolutely nowhere. And I think that's the providence of and the transparency of data is so useful for designers as well. Tamara, tell us a bit about, um, I think you're going to go into solar panel uh, production. <laughs> She's such a good advocate. It's, it's a whole career change. But what was the most, what was the most inspiring thing that you, you found when you were working on this project? Um, yeah, I mean, there was actually a lot of knowledge out there already that we had to find it was a hard task to really dig for everything uh, and then put it together. But then, yeah, when you start calculating things, um, it's really inspiring because you can, as the, the solar panels, um, um, it's, it shows you that it can be done. Um, it's possible. It's always possible to go one step further, I think. And here, I think we are start starting somewhere. Uh, but then, like, it can go on and on, and we can become better every time we plan an exhibition. Um, so, yeah, I think even, I really hope that the digital version wa will be uh, a success and that people will, s will start using it and um, contribute to it. Um, and I'm really looking forward for that. Yeah. I think that will absolutely make this toolkit, because the need for keeping the data up to date and also the sharing of experience and the sharing of suppliers and the locality, you know, we were talking about that. It's really, really key. So yes, we look, I'm very much looking forward to that, to that version. And then also, you know, we can, all of us can take it back to wherever we are and start spreading it, spreading the news and spreading the usage. Um, there were a lot of, I mean, what was quite interesting in this as well, there's lots of definitions. So you, so there's very practical pieces like, you know, don't keep your emails. I got a brilliant email from Anna yesterday that just said at the bottom, uh, if you don't need this email, consider deleting it. And I'm like, that's, that was quite really clear, just one sentence. I thought, brilliant, actually, because I've read it and perhaps I don't need to keep it. So, so things like that, very, very practical. And then, and then it's, there's another line that says, consider closed loop um, design on this, and I'm like, wow, that's a massive area. So I think um, this idea of definitions of sustainability, resource efficiency, oh, I've got 30 seconds, I'll shut up. Um, but all of these things, uh, oh, for Q&A, okay, fine. Um, so this understanding of, did you have a lot of fun just finishing off on that, like working out how, you're, how you are going to define these areas of these words within your toolkit? Um, hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it like because we are all also designers. We're uh, me and Jan were just finishing our um, uh, our degrees, and it's um, we we actually came like came from ourselves. Like we we were asking ourselves what w would we need, um, um, and then. Yeah, it, it, we also got feedback from other production teams, so we were really like trying to just um, do a lot of evaluations, and it's really nice because then you get feedback and um, new ideas, and uh, it's really nice to work collaboratively on these things. If we just mention um, a version of the toolkit in its early stages was um, given to all the other production platforms that participated here for BIO and the museum um, to get feedback on um, how they responded to it, if it was understandable. Because when you're researching something, you get really into the topic and you, you have a broader picture, but then giving that knowledge forward, it can be unlegible, um, but you just don't see it. Yeah, and I love the way that you, um, when you first read it, you're like, okay, and then suddenly you open it up and you go, oh, 
<laughs> There's a whole load of other information in here. This is it's like, it's a magic, secretive magic. So, um, but it is a fantastic toolkit. Um, I open it up to you all, to those that have used it, to those that have read it. Have you got any questions you'd like to ask the authors? Hi, my name is Dawn. Uh, I'm curious, what's the next step for, for, for your team after this toolkit? Because as uh, Sophie mentioned, that, that, you know, given that aside from the grid or the framework of the instructions, it's also important for the material side, like how you actually source the material. Are you guys going to like maybe build up a database of connections, like what kind of resource we can locate to, to, to stop it? to step things up further, or you guys have other further plans to really shape up the team for future development? We, we would love to. Uh, we hope that uh, museum will actually support us in this, uh, because uh, with this online toolkit, it's actually something that people can contribute, and of course we will edit it, and we will it will grow. We With all the calculators and resources, we of course this is just a start, and we will definitely uh, make uh, additions to it and so on because uh, every day actually is something that uh, comes out and um, it's actually or it's as it was said before new knowledge so, so, suddenly we understand that something that we were very keen on yesterday it's, it needs to be changed because of it um, so in a way we we are definitely hoping that biennial and museum will see the, see this because right now because they will sign the pledge they will need to use it <laughs> so uh, and we we are very keen to actually uh, to grow knowledge with them because we will we, as we said we are constantly learning as well and uh, while uh, doing these workshops for museum staff here at the mao and also for other museums which will hopefully join uh, the pledge um, we will definitely like to contribute it and develop this uh, further. So yes, um, if the opportunities and if the funding and if the knowledge will be there, yes, we are very keen to actually to collaborate further. And uh, this is a part of uh, our, actually, let's say, kind of a, uh, to help with roadmap and action plans and so on. I, I also teach at the Academy of Fine Arts and Design of the University of Ljubljana. We also signed the pledge uh, at uh, December 2021. So this kind of a knowledge that we got from Toolkit, uh, they are also collaborating with me as my assistant. So it's actually something that is we will, it's actually already uh, changing, let's say, directions, not only for the museums, but as it was said in the morning, so for other cultural production or academies, and I hope in education and so on, because the last reports that we can read from IPCC, it's actually saying that, uh, the climate change is actually a pedagogical or educational emergency. So here is a lot of things that we can do, and I think we can collaborate because museums are here to educate us, as we said, collective action, uh, and so on. So I think that if more of us... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a fundamental, isn't yeah. it? I think also, if you look at examples like um, Sarah Kassam at the b &A, who's now unfortunately left, she set up a materials library there for all of their curatorial and build teams. And she also, uh, I mean, she's done a huge amount of work. There's a lot of information, and it's a very good report that she wrote about it. Um, but when she left, she embedded all that knowledge in different parts of the, the, the organization, the institution, so that it wasn't lost. And I think that's very important, you know. So there's a lot of, you know, procurement team know how to write it into the briefs for the designers, and then uh, the inventories sit with, you know, the uh, the estates manager and all of these bits. So that kind of understanding is so so crucial because what tends to happen is that knowledge is lost if someone leaves and goes to another institution. So you ne really need to embed that into. That's my mm. <laughs> piece to add in. Um, so we have 30 seconds left. So I've got a last final quick question. And no one asked, what is sustainability? Because that will just take forever. <laughs> yeah, we were dead here, come on. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Is the toolkit available to, to buy or to get No, you can get it. It's, it's, open it's just source. over there behind over you. There. Yes, please take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, absolutely. it's over there. And yeah, yeah. we look forward to seeing it online and open to everyone. Well, online, yes. it will also be open source. So, yes, uh, we made it. So we, it's, it's not our knowledge. We wanted it to share. We wanted it to collaborate. We wanted it to grow. So, yes, it's absolutely our knowledge. Uh, 
Um, and so we would be very I uh, interested in getting the um, toolkit, at yeah, least our brilliant. director. Yes, absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, the Slovenian version is coming in a week. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, yes, it's the, Eng it's the English version at the moment, but, oh, it, okay. but it will go into Slovenia. Well, thank you so much, and congratulations for creating such an amazing tool. And, and thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you very much, Sophie, and congratulations to Team Futuring. Um, I'm, I'm sure that the toolkit will be useful for many of us here. I know I'll be using it in my own practice going forward. Um, so I think we're going to take a short break now, just about 10 minutes. So if we could be back here for about 12.30 and um, we'll finish the next session then.
Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Um, so I'd like to welcome you for our third and final session today. Um, and I'd like to invite Jane with us to join, it, to join us in leading a discussion on designing super vernaculars with our amazing design teams. Um, Eva Kellenberger and Sebastian White from Kellenberger White, Rok Snidosic from Medprostor, and Gasper uh, Ursic and Alias Vessel from Studio Crew and Studio AA. Good, got enough chairs. <laughs> Great. Um, thank you, Raya, thanks. Um, actually, it's been really interesting for me to hear the talks this morning, and there's a couple of points I'd sort of, by way of introduction, quite like to, of this session, pick up on. Um, the first was the sort of the toolkit um, and the open source distribution and the nature of vernacular in a sense, or well, how that ties back to the theme of the Biennale super vernaculars, because I draw great, or there are strong parallels between open source and the vernacular and modes of sharing information, knowledge, collaboration. And I think that's sort of one of the fundamentals here and one of the things that we can sort of talk about through making the material form of the exhibition embody the theme in that way. Um, and the other one I'd just like to say is that with the travel point, um, yes, we did reduce the footprint through working with local teams. It was also something that came about through COVID. Um, and, you know, in the summer of 21, I wasn't about to devise a Biennale that required a lot of people to come together because it might not have happened. Um, but we, although those figures look like one thing, and I do think it's very important to put the resource in locally, I also think um, international exchange, creative exchange is equally important. We mustn't forget that. It's just how you do it and how you make it happen. And I think we see that on our panel. We have Med Prostor, the exhibition designers from Ljubljana, AA, Aliash from AA, Gaspar from Crew, who work together. And then we threw into the mix Kellenberger White, Sebastian and Ava. And I think nobody here had really worked together before, is that right? Um, and it's become, you know, it was one thing at the beginning and sometimes quite difficult meeting by Zoom when we never really, or well, I'd met you, but you hadn't met. So I think, you know, we have to remember the power of meeting and inspiration. And also, I think, most importantly, you know, there's the numbers side of um, sustainability and there's the creativity and imagination that you bring to it. And I think this is something, you know, really with the team here um, to not make a difference between um, sort of sustainability and design, but bring them together to challenge processes, met methodologies and aesthetics through it and how it can embody change, express the theme of the exhibition super vernaculars, but also express the approach and perhaps make it quite provocative. Because I think, as the, you, know, you were saying earlier, that you, you're doing all this, and you know, that's what we discovered working here, that it's happening. We thought, what can we do? We could kind of make it a bit visible, a bit provocative, sort of put it on the front page. And I think that was part of the point of this exhibition, and it's slightly punky design in a way. Um, so I think, first of all, you know, Actually, it was only last November, wasn't it, Rock, when we met? Yeah. Um, we had a small kind of, we asked people here, and we sort of, you, you know, we knew from research about the architectural scene, but we didn't really know, you know, we were meeting people, we had to find a way. Um, and we wrote this brief about circular materials and minimizing waste, but also expressing um, the concept of this through the design. Um, and I think we had a meeting at Med Prostor's office and Rock came up with the idea of firewood. And then, mistakenly, it did seem a bit like a silver bullet. 
And so I should always have been suspicious of that because <laughs> I had a very convincing presentation and argument. Um, and I'm, of course, delighted that we went with it. But would you explain a bit about the concept rock? And can I also just say there's meant to be a slide loop? Um, if we can get it up, it would be great. Um, of the designer's work and so on. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question and uh, for everything, for, for this opportunity of uh, being part of uh, this initiative. Um, and uh, we, are, we learned a lot from um, this um, in, in this last uh, month um, from you and from all the teams. And um, it is for us always a question. Um, it is um, not first exhibition on that scale. It is first in, uh, here in Mao. And um, for me, uh, it's m maybe the most important question how to make a certain place, um, exhibition space as a place, uh, as a placeholder, as a something um, stay that's uh, staying in your mind after the exhibition as a, as a place, not just as um, um, a topic, as uh, uh, content of the exhibition um, elements and uh, thoughts and everything, but also how to define um, in some special way um, the, the space you're intervening. And um, um, in, in, on, and on the other hand, how to reflect the topic. And, um, and maybe the, the third uh, level is how to um, understand the scale of, um, of the exhibition space and the scale of the whole content. How, if, if it's necessary to, to bound something together or you need to, to separate some maybe too strong um, content and um, here was um, something that we are not um, quite. Um, it was not possible to 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 define at, at the beginning what will be the exhibition elements. Uh, that there is something uh, um, more conceptual than. Um, than, than um, um, haptic and um, because of that we decided to, to make some reflection on a topic and uh, on a scale uh, which have to um, bound together all this marvelous uh, um, I don't know, examples of this global initiative. So how to bound them together into, into something um, stay, that could stay in your mind after you're uh, leaving the, 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 uh, this exhibition? Yeah, I think you've done that beautifully, actually. Um, but it's also a marriage of the wood and how you've used that and the craft of putting it together, I think, is really important but also the graphics, and that story began with the font. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that, Ava and Sebastian? So, yeah, we were asked to do the um, identity, and we, um, our studio is very interested in um, typographic voice, so making, building a character with typography rather than, you know, you can do it with illustration, image, other things. Um, and especially for a Biennale, we like, uh, of when a group of things come together, we like to not give one thing a priority or choose one uh, uh, artist or designer, but do that through the typographic voice. So, um, yeah, we, we started with um, trying to think of what is to, you know, first of all, what is what is a sense of place of where this um, exhibition is taking place, but also obviously the theme of um, what is actually an eco-font 
what, what, what could that be? And we need a lot of research, and I think one of the special things for this project is that your brief really made us do all that research, which sometimes can be a bit, quite often clients want something like in two or three weeks. Um, you know, can you show us something then? And, uh, and maybe this, this, whether it's, whether you don't have time because of other projects going on, it's, it's really allowed us to do a lot of um, research into the subject. Um, and, you know, it was from numerous things like um, narrow fonts, um, lighter fonts. There was, um, we found this um, um, study that in the, if the US government would change their fonts, um, they would um, do something more narrow. They would um, um, save billions on energy and ink and paper. Um, so things like that we learned on the way, and uh, but we we tried to also then create the f the form, um, so create that sense of place, um, and we were working with um, with everyone at the museum, and they have this amazing collection of uh, Plechnik. Um So we looked at uh, the drawings, and we are as a studio very interested in the kind of back of house, like what what happens. How were things created? How were things uh, drawn? So the annotations of the architectural drawings of Plechnik had this really amazing um, like hand drawings, but as also there was a kind of geometric um, uh, uh, forms in it. So it kind of combined two things. We were very like something drawn by hand, but still have a kind of um, um, something that I guess the tools of that time as a ruler and maybe a compass. Um, and so that's how we started then drawing this typeface. Uh, and it was important that, like, you know, the, the little um, ink blots at, at the ends were visible. So it's not something that we would totally take away the hand. It's important that this um, stays. Um, so it's a kind of a synthesis between um, the hand and drawn um, digitally on the computer as well. Thank you. No, I think that, that's super interesting. It does, it's conveyed in the final use. But you made the lock-up and the font, and then it was sort of handed. It's a sort of, a, a, it's like pass me parcel, sort of handing on something to studio crew, Gasper and Alias from AA, and what they then did with it. And I think what's been great, we had lots of discussions at the beginning, but you kind of made it your own and turned it into something through the materiality of how it was realised, how it's put in the exhibition, coming up with different systems to get away from vinyl or foam boards or the usual things. And can you tell us a bit about, you know, and also had some reservations about a font based on Pleshnik locally, I would say. Okay. Uh, um. Um, I remember you saying to me, in London, would you, um, w w what would happen if we made a font ma based on Mr. Beck's typography for the London Tube? <laughs> so it was quite an interesting debate from the beginning, which I actually really appreciated because it made us think. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of the first time that we found ourselves in this position that we would kind of do an answer to somebody else's design, because otherwise we're also typographically first studio, so we choose typography as well as you do, maybe at some different way. And this was kind of a restriction in the first, first place, but then we kind of embraced it and tried to do some our life into it. But then, of course, Biennial is much more than just a poster, and we had to start to think, you know, what will happen in the exhibition, how can we use this Plechnik font for longer text, and as long as, because it is only uppercase font, we immediately know that it will not go through just using using this font. So we started to do a bit more of, of a system. We, we, our first, actually, um, proposal was was more focused on this sustainability part of the the brief. Um, it was more rough, so we kind of thought in in sense of like medium is the message, so how sustainability works on the web, how does it work in exhibition, how does it work in, I don't know, in, um, in uh, social media and stuff. Um, but then kind of, you know, through the process, through the talks, through the feedbacks, we kind of, you know, made big, like, dividers between, like, exhibition and the other, like, promotional materials. So 
Um, one thing that we experience is that sustainability is kind of challenging because event like biennial um, brings a lot of expectations from different uh, stakeholders, like uh, an example, marketing team, it's, you know, they work on their own and then you have to, you know, um, making a decision whether, you know, you will print another Forex board outside for some promotional thing or, and we really find ourselves to have the more control in the exhibition part of biennial. So, um, if I'm completely honest, we more invested our time in thinking about how the exhibition will look like and then maybe just put this poster and promotional thing a bit on the side, but like not, we're, we did it professionally, but we kind of found our um, silver lining in the exhibition. So, um, yeah, we found that probably the, the, the less um, sustainably uh, uh, um, heavy thing to do is to only print, you know, graphics here in Mao. So we actually use the printer in Mao uh, secretary office and print everything there, except like the huge graphics because it, no printer can print A2 formats. So we also contacted Sophie about, you know, this Xerox versus HP thing and uh, ink. And yeah, then we decided we made this decision and actually we built whole exhibition with only two packs of A3 paper plus some extra paper. It was not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And do you think the limitations help the design in the end? To me, it's it's very eloquent way of expressing the brief through the, these rather delicate walls of fluttering paper. Yeah, I think, um, well, I think they do influence the design a lot. I think it was really specific at this project because uh, we joined this process of all present here uh, last. So, uh, um, um, Rock and Matt Proster team has this really strong concept with firewood going on. We really liked it. And um, uh, also, uh, Sebastian and Eva uh, had their thing going with the typeface. So, these were both really strong elements. And we were like, Okay, what else can we contribute? How 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 do we how do we squeeze in ourselves? Um, and then then what this was then the, it was a third uh, parameter we needed to um, 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 count in was the sustainability. So this was another really limiting. So we were like feeling like a bit frustrated always also almost at one point because there was really what what else can we do? And um, then um, I think the. Like Gaspar said, we answered the sustainability issue with like printing the printing the entire exhibition like here in on the regular office printer. Um, but that was also uh, a, a thing that we thought that was kind of vernacular and kind of similar to what Rock and Matt Broster did because uh, their concept of the firewood is really about modularity. What can you do from a basic building block, which is a log? And we said, okay, what's the maybe uh, graphic design equivalent? It's a like. A4 or A3 paper. It's a like really readily uh, available uh, piece of paper which you can buy in any uh, office supply store. So, um, and then um, we chose the yellow color, which is uh, something like the, the paper is pre-colored, so the yellow color is not printed. Um, which is also a vernacular thing because that's how local. Uh, shops which sell clothes do the, their branding in the office fronts, you know, so like the yellow is most contrasting thing and then you can just do black and white prints on it and it looks attractive, but it's a really uh, cheap and convenient way to do it. So that's our uh, um, contempor more contemporary vernacular, maybe it's a bit of a 90s thing, what can you do with the Xerox, maybe you just uh, have office paper and print it um, and then uh, put all these paper pieces together to make a larger sign. That was the response to the modularity thing. So, But it was sustainable at the same time because we just hammered them with nails, but we hammered them really slightly, so we didn't damage the nails. You can take all the nails out and like <laughs> the the museum will be intact, only little, little tiny holes which nobody will notice. So. Um, <laughs> So I think our yeah. main contribution to, to, to this biennial is the yellow color, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's certainly very powerful, but I think it's also, you know, embodying in an inspiring way the aesthetic of sustainability and the theme too. 
And I, th I think that's where it's super imaginative and creative in a way that it becomes, because you have some slide that will go past here that has sustainability on one side, and I can't remember if it's aesthetic or beauty on the other, like never the twain shall meet. Um, but somehow I think that's actually what you've really managed to do. And I think we have to explore different aesthetics that celebrate some of the challenges. There's a piece in the exhibition by Francesca of Arabeschi di Latte that talks in the beauty of scarcity and it was a manifesto she's made and that's particularly for food and how to counter the massive problems of waste that we have to embrace frugality and shift away from, I don't know if it's the same here, but much discussion at the moment in the UK about the supermarkets two for one culture um, and the government will meant to legislate against that, but they've backtracked because of the cost of living and all these debates. So I think it's really important in this transitional phase to make it all so apparent. But there are also massive challenges along the way. And perhaps I'll ask each of you in turn to talk a bit about the granular challenges and perhaps the frustrations of it and what you would do differently. So seven, Ava. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Sorry, it's quite a lot in one. Yeah, I think what made this project so different for us to another project is was more of a maybe a philosophical issue as well, because this is something that's affecting all of us. It's multi generational, and and it, every generation or community group needs an idea, and maybe that's what vernacular is all about. But the title is is almost like an ism. It's a call to action, and um, we were sort of a bit confused at the beginning because we thought, could we make, could we make something that's useful, like a, like a product? But then we started to think how to think about this project process like a brand, and so we had to spend a lot of time trying to synthesise a lot of different ideas. Um, and I think a lot of our conversations were sense-making in a way. You know, we weren't just sense-making ourselves, but there was a lot of reflection. So I think that's so important when you're developing brand. It was almost like we're, we were each other's focus group or something like this. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we felt a little bit maybe like a tag team or a, a little unit back at school where we were just having to deal with this philosophical question, but we all needed to do something for the Biennale, something useful for the museum. Um, and I think we probably all thought about how we could try and make an artifact that we could pass on to people. Um, so how could we do something differently? A lot of the researchers um, pushed a lot of ideas um, into a sort of best practice uh, conversation that's happening in our studio. And so it's, it's informing nearly all of our projects now. So we're writing this down as, a, as a, some kind of studio guidebook. Um, but I'm just really curious about how you can make something completely net zero. So not reducing things, but how, how can we change visual culture? How can we turn the volume down? Because it's so noisy at the moment. You know, you only need to take a bus trip through town and see the amount of different posters and various advertising and people on their mobile phones even now. And um, everyone's sort of going through a kind of a visual <laughs> process. And um, I think part of, part of it in graphic design is maybe learning from the past, which is dialing down this visual culture. But it's, it seems like it's an impossibility. Um, but maybe technology is maybe the most advanced technology is something that we need to keep looking at as well as the most primitive. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that was meant to be, you know, in the super vernaculars, a slight contradiction in terms in the title. It's a vernacular for the 21st century and very much about embracing technologies, not looking backwards. Um, and the slight sort of, somebody described it as umami, a slight weird combination of words that sort of get under your skin a bit and I still have slight difficulty in explaining but <laughs> maybe that's kind of intriguing. Um, Rock, apart from the sort of you know the challenges of making and producing the exhibition 
with the firewood or what you'd learn from that or the system. Um, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, we've heard a little bit about buying the firewood. Also, we hadn't really thought firewood dry in summer doesn't necessarily, you know, it's not quite the season. <laughs> yeah, uh, it is a kind of message that, um, because I think um, if, if when you think about what represents Slovene mentality and Slovene uh, maybe households, it is some that concerning from for that self sustainability, um, uh, no, uh, self um, Czechoslovak. Um, Yeah, maybe like this. Uh, so, um, to it's very important to be yeah, self-sufficient. I, I wanted to find that word. I'm sorry. And uh, that firewood is uh, something that uh, almost each Slovenian households uh, have. Um, it uh, at home each year. Um, and um, it is something that m it uh, could be shown as a um, as a kind of answer to that um, energetic crisis, but mm. it is something that it was born before that and um, i don't know um, there is there's a lot of opportunities from this topic on um, how to understand this uh, self-sufficient uh, practice in Slovenia, um, uh, how to understand it as an uh, um, opportunity and as a problem in, in some other way. Um, and maybe it was more a uh, provocative questioning than answering, mm. uh, maybe representing that um, part of uh, our culture, our economics, um, than answering with, with it on some certain, uh, some certain question. And because of that, uh, we wanted to avoid um, Mm. making uh, compositions from that um, traditional um, way of uh, mm. that uh, uh, wood wood, uh, wood, wood uh, piles eh? um, yeah. but to uh, find some other way of uh, compositions some provocative way of composition, which uh, reminds us on, in a way that it is something we could find everywhere here around, but mm -hmm. it is on the same hand something different, something that you could see the most common element from Slovenian countryside in some other condition, in some mm. other... Um, Inside a building, or <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. piled not outside. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, that that provocative position is uh, something that we maybe want. What what could be uh, some new starting point to understand maybe. Mm. Um, yeah, that, I think I think that, that is the point. You have to have something. You can't just tweak the existing systems. You have to express different ones. And I think that comes through a lot of the projects in the exhibition too, um, that they're showing alternative ways of doing things. That, um, but I've just had a flag waved at me about Q and A. So does anyone have some questions? Sophie? <laughs>
you were using the luggage straps and then you shifted. So what was that? What made you shift? Yeah, it, uh, it, we understand um, designing um, process as some open process, uh, something which is never finished. And um, it is always searched. Uh, we wanted to find maybe the most appropriate way how to uh, represent some idea and how to maybe fix some unexpected uh, forum made of locks um, in a certain way. So how, how to use as less material as possible, how to use some maybe similar material, mat material than the locks are, like this um, straps, which were at first from Luca Cooper, from that port, um, Slovenian uh, port. Um, but you know you could you could not shape the um, rectangular forum with that. So we need we started with circular forms, yeah. and it works like here in uh, on that um, ground level. But we uh, decided not to have all uh, designed uh, at this on, on the same principle. And because of that, we were searching further. And that uh, lightning um, straps are, is, you know, it is something very common. Yeah. You need that in uh, many cases. Uh, in, in each building needs that. And uh, it is something that you, that there is no problem to, to use it again and again and again. So um, this is something we just borrow, very similar to, to the locks. And, um, no, I think it's what it shows is the, you have an idea and you've, you're following through with the sustainability kind of, the, well, the criteria that you want to get to, so that sustainability balance with appeal, but then you come across a problem and you still have to, you have to answer it in a way that still allows for the design. So you want to have rectangular forms and then you realize you can't do it because you're working in materials that aren't necessarily made for exhibition design. So you're having to constantly iterate the design all the way through, which I think is brilliant because actually as a designer myself, I love doing that. And it makes the curators a bit nervous, but... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, yeah. Thanks, yeah. yeah. You know, I think it is quite important that um, um, when you're designing things that um, it is, it has to be joy. Otherwise, I don't know what to do that job, you know? <laughs> and it's the main point, main point I think. It, you have to be curious how, how you um, um, find your job um, interesting for, uh, for yourself. And then it is a lot of possibilities that it will be um, well accepted uh, also from the people. And, mm. uh, yeah, I think we have to wrap up because we've got the sort of main signing of the pledge in a minute. But I think that's exactly it is, you know, one can't estimate the amount of work it takes to sort of pick up on alternative systems and run with them. And obviously it's a kind of transitional phase, but you know, I think that's one thing I learned from this. You're continually coming back to it. You know, so much easier to buy what they call four by fours panels or something, stick them up with some NDF and, you know, but um, so thank you very much, all of you, for sticking with the alternative routes and to Mao and Bio as well. Thank you. Thank you very much to Jane, Ava, Seb, Kashba, Aliaz and Rock.
Um, so, before to finish this weekend, uh, this morning's program, uh, Mao will be signing the Climate Neutral Pledge from the UN's Framework Convention on Climate Change. And I'd like to invite um, Barbara Pradhan to give an introduction and Dr. Bogo Supancic, Director of Mao, to sign the pledge. I'm ready to sign. <laughs> I think this is a small step for men, especially for director, but a big step towards better environment and nature. I suggest to take a photo with the pledge and all people here, please. Yes. Uh, maybe it'd be better to go outside uh, to where. Just a, a quick sign-off note, but thank you to all our speakers this morning. Uh, thank you very much for coming, and, and I would like to thank the British Council for their support for making this event possible. And please, for anyone who hasn't seen the exhibition, um, please do see it before you go, and also pick up the Futuring Toolkit on the way out. Thank you very much. And also, there is some catering in the courtyard afterwards as well, so you can have some refreshments. Thank you. Thank you.